All right, everybody, let's get this dinosaur party started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our live video chat from a dinosaur dig site from the desert of Utah with museum paleontologist, Dr. Lindsay Zano. Welcome to the program, everybody. My name is Chris Smith. I'm curator for the SCCU Daily Planet Theater at the museum, and I get the pleasure and privilege of hosting today's program for you, bringing you into the field with the museum's paleontology team. Now, if you've been hanging out around the Museum of Natural Sciences, following us on social media, then you may have seen or heard that the museum's paleontology team, one of the best in the business, is out looking for dinosaurs and lots of other prehistoric fossilized critters. They've been out for several weeks now in different locations throughout the West. Today, I'm excited to bring you Dr. Lindsay Zano, the head of paleontology at the Museum of Natural Sciences uh, and a professor at North Carolina State University who is out in the desert in Utah. Lindsay, how are things going? Hey, Chris, things are going great out here. This is week eight for the team and everybody's still doing really well. Week eight, that's, well, I'm glad to hear everybody's doing great. Uh, <laughs> how is it camping in the desert for eight weeks straight? It's great. Yeah, it's wonderful. We've had um, the whole spectrum of weather. We've had extreme heat, like higher than 115 degrees. We've had cold, rainy days. We've had sandstorms and windstorms. Uh, and here in the Mustn't Touch It, we usually get spontaneous hail storms. Sometimes we've had hail the size of like uh, grape tomatoes <laughs> hit us out here. So we kind of run the gambit of weather, but uh, we're having a great time. Hail the size of grape tomatoes. Yep. That and uh, it's hard to catch them in a cup. You know, we're, we're always short on ice. So we thought we would you know, play this game where we tried to catch hail in a cup. It's not as easy as you think, Chris. It's, it's actually a lot harder. <laughs> wow. I, I get in some way, I'm kind of glad that it's difficult. Like you're less likely to get smacked in the face. I don't know. It feels like you get hit in the head more than you get that ice in your cup. So, yeah. So oh, for those of you goodness. thinking about trying that, uh, maybe give it a second thought. Well, we're off to the races. It's already uh, a glamorous world in paleontology. Yeah, well, you know, it's real romantic out here. We, you know, we've been sweating for weeks straight. Uh, it's been 98 degrees at 1030 at night while we're trying to sleep. Uh, we've been picking and shoveling for weeks. And um, yeah, it's a real glamorous life out here, I can assure you. But you're getting to do a job that only a few people do, which is actually dig up dinosaurs. So tell us a little bit about where you're at right now and what makes this place special for your work. Well, we are at what I would say is the crew's favorite location of the summer, an area called the Mustn't Touch It. Um, and this is a time period right at the very beginning of the late Cretaceous, so about mm, 96, 97 million years ago. Um, it's relatively poorly known. There aren't a lot of rocks of this age that are exposed at the surface um, here in North America and really anywhere around the world. It's a pretty poorly known time period. And all of the dinosaurs that we find here are new. We've got um, new plant-eating dinosaurs and new meat-eating dinosaurs called theropods. Um, and so we've been out here for about, hmm, about 13 years now working this area. Um, and the, you can see behind me, the landscape is really beautiful. The weather's usually pretty great and the fossils are marvelous. So this is definitely one of our favorite places to be. I'm just relishing this view that you've got on top of this mountain hillside. Yeah, all the quarries have spectacular views. Um, we get the best sunsets here. Don't know why, but um, it's really a beautiful place to work. So. Uh, you're looking for theropods, meat-eating dinosaurs. Uh, have you come upon anything interesting so far? We may have lost Dr. Zano for a moment.
don't worry, everybody. The technical team is standing by, ready to solve any and all issues. We'll get Dr. Zano back in just a moment. Of course, it's a little tricky being out in the middle of the desert in Utah in order to get enough cell service to be able to broadcast a live program like this back to us. So we should be getting Dr. Zano back soon. We did have a strong connection right before she left. But you know what? We'll see. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, let's see here. Hold on, everybody. Let me introduce Dr. Christian Kammerer. Christian is a paleontologist at the museum. His role is research curator of paleontology with the museum. Christian, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris, thanks for having me. I'm coming at you from beautiful basement of downtown Raleigh. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm very glad that you could be with us as our, uh, as our backup paleontologist. So I am unfortunately not out uh, with the Utah crew right now. I'm holding things down here in NC, uh, but I'm happy also to answer some of your questions. You're talking about what sort of fossils are being found by the crew in the Mustn't Touch It right now. Um, and so as Lindsay was, was starting to say, this is kind of the dawn of what we consider, you know, the typical Cretaceous fauna. I mean, when you're thinking about like T-Rex, Triceratops, these are the earliest relatives of them. And hopefully I think Lindsay is coming back so she can explicate that further. Um, but these really like the classic Cretaceous animals, these horned dinosaurs, these giant tyrant dinosaurs, um, are really only, you see them in the very latest Cretaceous. So in this earlier forms, you're really, they're smaller bodied. They're not sort of like the, the Titans that you expect from seeing in museums and movies. So we're looking for, for dinosaurs that aren't that well known, but that are still also kind of familiar to people. Hey, Lindsay, welcome back. Hey, Chris, my phone is overheating, even though it's not that hot out here. So apologies, I'm trying to put it in the shade. Oh, gosh. I see. I was telling everybody about just getting cell service in the middle of the desert. But now we've got another <laughs> another issue to think about. Yeah, I've usually been taping bags of ice to the phone just to keep it cool enough to do the live streams. But uh, anyway, the fun and things gonna... we have to deal with out here. Sure thing. I'm going to turn myself sideways. Your video is, is rotated. Okay. So I'll just turn sideways and then we'll match. I can fix that. Give me a moment. Okay. <laughs> I'll let Christian elaborate on things. <laughs> sure um, thing. Okay. Yeah. Happy to. So, I mean, one of the other exciting things about this part of the Cretaceous as I mentioned that you get the early forms of these, these well-known later dinosaurs, but it's also a time of great transition. So you're seeing a lot of the, the species that were dominant in the Jurassic and the earlier Cretaceous members of those groups uh, sort of have their, their last hurrah um, before they, they go extinct long uh, before the actual sort of end Cretaceous mass extinction that we think wiped out the, the non-bird dinosaurs, basically. Um, but you do get these other smaller extinctions, uh, particularly hitting a lot of the the big predatory dinosaurs, things that were called carnosaurs, uh, the main predators of the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous, and also some of these groups like sauropods, the long neck dinosaurs, for which there's a lot of turnover between some of these more primitive sauropod groups and the titanosaurs, which is the this really gigantic sauropods that are the only ones that make it all the way through to the end of the Cretaceous. So we're seeing a lot of that turnover happening in faunas like the must and touch it. And understanding that is important to figuring out how these like classic Cretaceous communities came about. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, no problem. Lindsay, does that square with, with what you think as the head of paleontology? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, yeah, of course. Yes, that's an excellent explanation for what we're doing out here. Well, so then that sounds interesting then that uh, instead of maybe going after the, the places in the rock that have uh, Tyrannosaurus rex in them, you're actually trying to piece together uh, 
I don't know, dinosaur evolution by looking at a different time period? Yeah, I mean, it's really important when we ask these big picture questions about, you know, how life evolves over time and how climate affected how life changed and how ecosystems changed. We have to have the most complete record that we can, right? The more data we can have as scientists, the better. So when we have gaps, you know, time periods that are poorly sampled or areas of the world that are poorly sampled, we, you know, have a hard time answering these big picture questions with confidence because we have data gaps. And so we focus on filling in those gaps, going to places that haven't really been worked or studied or explored much so that we can add those data into our analyses and maybe be able to answer those bigger questions. So then how did you uh, discover the must and touch it as a place to go? Like, how do you know that this is where you can find uh, new species or try to fill in those holes? Well, uh, we certainly weren't the first paleo team to work the must and touch it. Um, however, the teams that were out here um, earlier on, you know, all the way, going all the way back to the 60s, really, um, were more focused on mammals and lizards and snakes and frogs and smaller animals. And so they were doing mostly what we call micro vertebrate sampling. So this is um, trying to find the fossils of all the smaller animals that lived in these ecosystems, and they weren't very interested in the dinosaurs. Um, and so we knew this was a good area with lots of fossils, but not many uh, teams had been out here actually trying to dig up and describe the dinosaur fauna. Oh, wow. I, I thought it would be the other way around. <laughs> well, as popular as dinosaurs are, they often aren't the most important thing to uh, dig up if you want to answer questions, because a lot of times you can get a much bigger sample of the small animals. You can um, collect hundreds to thousands of, you know, mammal teeth, for example, whereas it takes the same amount of time to collect one sauropod. It could be, it could take you a whole decade to dig up uh, one sauropod, right? So you can get a lot more data quickly if you work on some of the other animals that lived in the ecosystem. So, so dinosaurs are not everything, and they're certainly not always the most important thing for us to sample as paleontologists. Okay. Well, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting perspective and interesting to know. Uh, does that mean that you're having to like sift through mammal teeth in order to get to your dinosaurs? <laughs> well, we collect everything. I, uh, I tried to get our, one of our quarries in the background here, but I understand it's a little too small for you guys to see it, but we have this quarry in the background we call karmic orodromine. Um, that's the name of the site. And um, when we first founded it, it was this type of dinosaur called an orodromine, which is a small, um, you know, dog sized, really um, plant eating dinosaur. And it's the only group of dinosaurs for which we have really good evidence that they lived underground. At least some of the different species from this group lived underground. Uh, and so that was the first thing we found at this quarry. We started digging in. And then next to the dinosaur, we found a tiny crocodile. And then we joked that we would find a turtle next to the crocodile and a fish next to the turtle. And just yesterday they found the turtle next to the crocodile, <laughs> which is pretty unbelievable. So now we're expecting a fish and then, I don't know, maybe some invertebrates on the other side of the fish. Um, but we are collecting everything we find out here from, from the mammals and birds, um, the small tiny teeth and limb bones of tiny animals to all the way up to the dinosaurs. And you mentioned looking for new species and being able to find lots of new species. Um, and there's a question in the chat that I'm going to go right to because it's very relevant. Uh, one of the viewers is curious about Moros and Siach, which, uh, if I recall you telling me, uh, were found not too far from where you're at. Yeah, that's right. Moros um, is only known from one specimen, one partial hind limb, and there are a bunch of teeth around that we think probably belong to Moros, but they can't actually be um, confidently known to be from that exact species. So there's really just the one specimen, and it's from about a mile um, to the south of where I'm sitting. It was found uh, quite some time ago now in 2012. And then Siach was found the very first year we came to the Mustn't Touch It, um, I found Siach, and that's a little ways off, a couple miles in the other direction. Um, so we've we've had good luck finding some 
some interesting theropod or meat-eating dinosaurs, and, and now we've got a couple of plant eaters that we need to get named, including this orodromine and an iguanodontian that needs a name, and um, we also have a big oviraptorosaur that needs a name. I don't know if people are familiar with oviraptorosaurs, but they kind of look like um, overgrown cassowaries. If you've ever seen a cassowary, they have a big crest on their head. They have a toothless beak, just like a bird. They were covered in feathers. And from the Must and Touch It, we have uh, the biggest oviraptorosaur that lived in North America that we know of yet. It was probably about 15 feet tall. So if you can imagine like a giant turkey, 15 feet tall, that's, that's one of the dinosaurs we still have to name from here. Wow. The biggest one in North America. Yeah. By about 50%, actually. It's, it's enormous. Whoa. Wow. That's, that's huge. Okay. That's exciting. Has that one, uh, so that, has, that one's made it back to the museum for study? Uh, that, that specimen actually um, is at the Field Museum. We work very closely with a, a team of researchers, uh, Dr. Peter McAvicki, who's uh, one of our colleagues on this grant project that we're working on here. And he found that specimen and he, so he's working on the description of that and that, that lives at the Field Museum in Chicago. Oh, that's great to hear. They're an okay museum. <laughs> yeah, they're just all right. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Tell us all a little bit about what the work is like. Uh, you know, you get up in the morning, then do what? Well, so we have a, a decent sized camp right now. We have about 12 people and that consists of undergraduate uh, researchers, graduate students, and then a um, bunch of, of um, scientists, you know, um, faculty and curators are here. Um, and so we, we set up a remote camp. So it's a couple canvas tents. We've got propane stoves and coolers. We keep our food in coolers and we have to, um, water is our, basically our limiting factor. We can go through a hundred gallons of water in just a few days. And so we have these big water bladders to sort of keep the team hydrated. And, uh, we get up in the morning, we cook, a good breakfast this morning we had bacon and fried potatoes and we pack a lunch we fill our water bottles we get all our supplies that we need for the quarry for the day and we hike to the site and then we quarry till about seven to eight o'clock at night and hike back to camp cook dinner we do logging we, we, we write down all the data for all the specimens that we've collected that day um, we hang out sometimes if it rains we have we have a little projector we'll watch a movie or something or we have bocce ball, we'll play games or cards and then off to bed and starts all over again at six the next morning. Six the next morning. And then if you're, so you're working in a quarry, uh, how do you know when you've found something, uh, like I, I, you're finding lots of fossils, but when you find something that's uh, particularly interesting or that you need to get lots of eyes on or lots of hands working on, what's that like? Well, that's, that's one of these things about paleontology is it's, it's really a gamble and it's really hard to know when you find, when you find a site, whether it's a good site or it's not a good site. Um, so the process for us is we, we do what we call prospecting. So that's sending people out with a GPS and a radio and enough supplies for the day. And they hike all around the badlands. Like you see behind me, these gray badlands, and they're just looking for bone that's literally sticking out of the side of the hill. Um, and so they find something, it might be just a little bit of bone, or it might be a lot of bones sticking out of the hill and they record it and they take all the data about where it's found and who found it and all these things. Um, and we're allowed to dig one square meter, which is about three feet or so to sort of explore whether we think it's a good site. Um, and then if we think it's a good site, that's going to require a big excavation. We have to cover it up put in a permit because this is federal land with the federal government and it takes a year for that permit to get processed. Sometimes it takes two years, sometimes it takes three years. And by the time we get that permit, then we can actually open up the site and see what's there. So when we discover a new site, it takes at least a year for us to really know if we've got anything good. Um, and sometimes you apply for a permit, you open it up and there's nothing else there. And you've sort of done all that work for no reason. But sometimes you open it up and there's way more there than you thought was going to be there. And that's actually the case with the site behind me. When I first found Karmic, it was just 
maybe three inches of one bone sticking out of the side of the hill. And I thought it's probably not much. Um, but we decided to put a permit in for it anyway. And it ended up being an extraordinary site with all kinds of things in there, crocs, turtles, um, several dinosaurs, skeletons. So it's kind of hard to tell when you first find something how good it's going to be. Wow, that's incredible. So what, what brought all of these things together then? Like how in one site do you get crocs and turtles and microfossils and then also the dinosaurs? Well, I mean, if you look behind me now, this is obviously sort of a desert environment. There are very few plants, um, got these exposed badlands. It's very relatively dry and hot. But back in the Cretaceous, when um, these sediments were actually being deposited and these dinosaur bones were being buried, this was a very lush coastal plain. So it would have looked something like, you know, the Mississippi Delta. Um, because this area actually had a big seaway cutting through the center of North America. And this part of Utah was a coast along that seaway. So there were these big deltas with these swamps and mangroves all en emptying into the seaway. And that's the environment that's preserved here in these rocks today. Um, so when you have a lot of water, you can get uh, animals that die sort of get um, sometimes transported a little bit or accumulate in places from water or they die in watery environments and they get buried by sediment very easily. And so that's kind of how everything gets buried. And then when the rocks got lifted later on in time and exposed and, and erosion starts to reveal all those layers from the Cretaceous and now we can see everything on the surface. It's, a, it's wild to think about this landscape behind you being just a lush riverside or a coastal environment <laughs> and then looking at it now and it's just shades of gray and brown but yeah full of so I, much cool stuff it, it, it is it is really remarkable and i have to say even as paleontologists you know we still we still find it remarkable to think about these things sometimes and what i find is always really marvelous is when we find plant sites because there's something about the actual preservation of leaves that really transports you back into what that environment looked like in your mind. You know, I mean, bones are great, but it, there's something about the leaves and the preservation of the plants that really can kind of give you a picture of what the environment was like. So I love when we find plant material out here. It can really help transport your mind back in time. Do you find much of the plant material or is it more rare than, say, the uh, vertebrate? or invertebrate? Uh, in this particular area, it's pretty rare. We have only about two plant sites, um, these sort of dark organic shale layers where um, these plants were lining these sort of swampy areas and they get preserved in these nice shaley layers and you kind of crack them all open and see the plants inside. Um, but we only have a couple of sites from, from here that have nice plant materials, so they're still pretty rare. So... While you're out, you're, you do some prospecting, you find bone, you get permission to open up a quarry like the ones you've got going now. Uh, then how do you get the dinosaurs prepared and out? How do you get to them, I guess, first? How do you dig them up and then get them back to a museum for actual study? Well, it's definitely a skill. I mean, most of the students are out here are, are out here to learn how to excavate well, um, and you have to develop a technique. But you know, essentially, what you're trying to do is you're not trying to expose the fossil here in the field because you get rainstorms and, like I said, the weather, and you know, you're not in a controlled environment. So when you find a bone, you try and assess well, what kind of bone is it, and that'll give you an image in your mind of how big it should be and what shape it should be, and you kind of try and work digging a trench around that bone without taking all the rock off it. And you get a trench going and then we'll use plaster and burlap or sometimes um, pre-made medical bandages, the same ones they use when you break an arm and they wrap your arm in a cast. Uh, and so we'll, we'll wrap that bone in rock that's on a pedestal now in plaster and let that harden. And that makes a nice protective casing that holds the fossil together and it holds the rock around the fossil together. And then we'll dig deeper and sometimes underneath it a little bit and we'll flip it over and then we'll have the whole thing and we'll plaster the other side. And then we end up with a, a fossil encased in the rock, encased in this plaster, hard plaster cast. And that protects the fossil until it gets to the museum. 
Uh, and of course, we have to hand carry all these uh, rocks and fossils from the quarry to camp where they can be loaded on the vehicles. And sometimes they're small and they just weigh a few pounds and sometimes they're big and they weigh thousands of pounds. So it sort of depends. If they're really small, you can throw them in a backpack or if they're less than like 100 pounds, you can throw them in a backpack and carry it out. If they're bigger than that, between like 100 pounds and say four or 500 pounds, we put them on a sled. Um, it's like a, a sled for um, emergencies, for carrying people who get hurt out in the field. And we, we ratchet strap it to the sled and then we get a team of people that stand around the sled and everybody grabs a handle and we, we haul it out by hand. And then if it's more than 500 pounds or so, um, we have to get a helicopter usually because there's no way to drive up to the quarry and bring a vehicle. So we'll get a helicopter and we'll flip it into a net and we'll have the helicopter bring it to camp so we can load it on the trailer or the vehicle. Yeah, I've seen some of these videos of uh, the helicopters coming in to get the really big fossils. And then uh, there's also folks can look on the museum's YouTube channel and, and find these videos. And then there's also a great video of when they get back to the museum and there's a dozen people trying to push it through <laughs> the the freight elevators and through the doors of the museum to get these enormous dinosaurs uh, back to North Carolina. It's impressive stuff. I really like when the helicopter carries it. It's a much better. <laughs> it's much better to see the helicopter carrying this huge jacket off than to know you have to haul it down the hill yourself. So that's always a joy. And you don't have to hike back. That's true. You get in the helicopter, right? It's it's a marvelous thing, but very expensive. So obviously, we can only do it rarely. We did um, we did have a big duckbill dinosaur early in the summer that we excavated, and we were able to carry down about eight hundred pounds worth of bones from that hadrosaur down the hill and into the trucks. But we had to leave about a thousand pounds of it on the hill till we can get a helicopter next year, because some of those. Um, bones are about five feet long. And so those jackets weigh, you know, eight, 900 pounds a piece. So next year we will have to get a helicopter and maybe we can um, get that up on the website and people can watch us helicopter that duckbill dinosaur off the hill. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. All right. Well, uh, you ready for some audience questions? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of folks on the stream posting questions. And I remind everybody you can drop questions into the chat. I'll also remind everybody to please be kind, be a good digital citizen uh, in the things that you're typing into the chat, or we'll moderate. Okay, uh, let's see. We've got lots of dino fans here. Um, and maybe some dinosaur experts as well. Jacob wants to know, is the time period that you're looking at specifically in the Cenomanian age? Yes, the Mosin Touch It is Cenomanian in age. We've done a bunch of um, dating. So we've done um, dating of the rocks here. They're actually ash layers. So when volcanoes erupt and the ash gets laid down in these layers, we're able to precisely date the timing of that volcanic eruption. And so we use that to bracket the age of the quarries. We usually can't date the quarries themselves, but if we have a date below and we have a date above, then we know about the time that that, um, that dinosaur lived. And so we have a lot of ash layers in the must and touch it. It's really rich with ashes. In fact, we found a really beautiful one right at the top um, yesterday. And so our team geologist is out today collecting more samples to age date that one. Cool stuff. And we talked a little bit about this uh, with Christian on too, but the sort of uh, the time periods and, and specifically how they, where the th these theropods fit in. So Moros and Siach are both this, uh, is this late Cretaceous, but then the more well-known theropods like T-Rex are from early or do I have them backwards? So T-Rex is much younger. Uh, so T-Rex is about 66 million years ago, and Moros and Siach lived about 30 million years before T-Rex. So when you're talking about dinosaurs, there's so much time between when some of these dinosaur species lived. In fact, we are closer in time to when T-Rex lived than to when the first dinosaurs uh, were to T-Rex. So it's a long time period with a lot of time in between when all these species were around. 
Got you. Thank you. Uh, Jacob was curious about an, uh, one called Avia Tyrannus. Yeah, that's not from this area. Um, in fact, in North America, the Tyrannosaur record is pretty poor. Um, and that's one of the things that makes Moros, the Tyrannosaur from this um, particular area, pretty special um, is that it fills in a gap. There was about a 70 million year gap between all those well-known Tyrannosaurs like T-Rex and some of its contemporaries and the earliest Tyrannosaurs that we had in North America, which were from the Jurassic. And so Moros sort of fills in that time period. We need many, many more Tyrannosaurs to be discovered from that time period. Um, and one was actually named right after Moros that was just a little bit younger. So we're sort of starting to fill in those gaps in the Tyrannosaur record here in North America. Um, but many of the Tyrannosaur species um, that we know of are from China, from Mongolia, some are from, from Europe as well. Exciting. Excellent stuff. And Lindsay, it looks like we lost your video feed. Oh, now you're back. I'm back, but I do have a low battery going on the phone because the sun is draining it out. So maybe we have about five or 10 more minutes, Chris. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Art's got a good question. How big is the area that you're searching on this dig? That is a great unusual question. It's actually very small. Um, this, this particular rock um, strata or layer um, only crops out or is exposed at the surface in a very small area here um, in central Utah along just the edge of a big thing we call the San Rafael swell, which is like a big dome in the central of Utah. And so we're sitting right along the edge in a little line of badlands. Um, and I would say the must and touch it really is only exposed hmm, maybe about 30 30 or 40 miles, but in a very thin strip. So not a lot of outcrop to look at. All right. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Braylon age seven wants to know what the first bone you ever found was. Oh my. Um, what was the first bone? The first fossil bone I ever found. I guess um, it was probably a phytosaur bone. This is sort of a, an animal that looks a lot like a crocodile with a long snout from the Triassic. Um, I first started doing paleontology field work at the University of New Mexico, and they did a lot of work in an older time period called the Triassic when dinosaurs first evolved. And so my first fossils were not dinosaur fossils. Um, they were sort of dinosaur cousins. There you go, Braylon. Excellent stuff. Do you have a, a favorite dinosaur that you like really hope to find while you're in the field? I don't have a favorite dinosaur. I think that's kind of like saying what's your favorite pet or your favorite kid. You know, they're all so incredible and unique. Um, and there's so much to love about all the different types of dinosaurs. And so I guess my favorite dinosaur is usually whichever one I'm working on at the moment. Uh, and then we get it published and we move on to the next new favorite dinosaur. <laughs> uh, Charlotte wants to know how they can become a paleontologist. Well, to be a paleontologist, you kind of have to be a jack of all trades when it comes to science. Um, in particular, you have to be um, you have to study geology and you have to study biology. And the reason you have to study those two things is because you have to understand the animals that you're working with, but you have to understand the environment that they're buried in. And you have to understand both of those things. So geologists usually get degrees in, uh, I'm sorry, paleontologists usually get degrees in geology and in biology, and they sort of work at the interface of those two disciplines. And so if you want to be a paleontologist, you have to study those things. But we also use a lot of new technologies. Some people um, get uh, engineering backgrounds. Some people get molecular backgrounds and they work on molecular paleontology. Basically, if you want to be a paleontologist, you just pick a field of geology or biology and you work on fossils instead of living animals. And so you can be so many different kinds of paleontologists. There you go. There you go, Charlotte. All right, let's see here. Um, there's been a discussion going on about how you use the bathroom in the field, but I don't think you have to answer that one. 
<laughs> well, we don't, let's put it this way. We don't have running water. We don't have facilities. We don't have electricity. So most of the time we don't even have cell service. So, um, you know, we follow wilderness practices. We're out here. Um, we actually have a, a river toilet, which is just like an aluminum box that, you know, people go to the bathroom in and we empty that at a camping station. And so, you know, we're really careful to take care of the land that we work. We want to leave as little impact as we can. You know, we don't want to leave waste out here. We don't want to trample everywhere. We don't want to leave garbage. And so we, we pack everything in, we pack everything out, and we just follow those same old wilderness practices you'd follow if you're out hiking or out camping in the Appalachia or anywhere else. Does that also mean you fill in the quarries when you're done? It absolutely does. It means at the end of each season, we rebury everything we just spent all that time <laughs> unburying. <laughs> and then at the beginning of the next season, we unbury what we rebury. Um, but that's, you know, that's what we have to do to maintain uh, the beautiful landscape that we have around here. Excellent. And maybe we've got time for another one here. Um, and depending on finding bones that protrude through the surface, do you think you're missing anything by not searching deeper? Oh my gosh, certainly. <laughs> I think every paleontologist when they're out prospecting wishes for x-ray eyes so we could see what's not exposed at the surface. But then again, that would kind of take the fun out of it, I guess, you know. Um, but that's why we come back and we resurvey areas that we surveyed um, a while back. So maybe every 10 years, we kind of go back to an area we, we walk walked one time because new bones might be eroding and be exposed that weren't exposed before. Um, but certainly we're missing lots of amazing stuff that's just under the surface. But you can imagine looking behind me, you also just can't walk around digging random holes everywhere. Or you'd never find anything. So um, that's kind of just the luck of the draw. All right, there you go. Well, Lindsay, I would imagine that our our time and in, in your phone battery is probably nearing the end. Probably. We got to charge everything with solar panels out here. Uh, so when we don't have a lot of sun, we, we don't have a lot of charge. Well, Lindsay, thanks for uh, climbing up to the top of that mountain in order to join us and, and do this program today. Well, it's my pleasure, Chris. It was really great talking to you again. And everyone, thanks for joining us and love your questions. So we'll see you again, I think, in a couple of weeks. Is that right, Chris? That's right. Uh, everybody, we'll be back here at noon on Wednesday, August 4th, as part of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. And uh, Lindsay, where will you be then? We will still be here, but hopefully we'll have some new discoveries to share with you by then. Exciting. There's a good reason to come back on August 4th, everybody. We'll see what new stuff has come out of the rocks since then. So everybody, hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. Lindsay, it was great to connect and great to hear stories about what's happening out there uh, in Utah and looking forward to the next one. Everybody, yeah. make sure that you follow along uh, the museum on social media. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And Lindsay, I know you post stuff online too from the field. How can people stay in touch? Yeah, we are tweeting and um, we have an Instagram. Instagram is Xanolab Live and we tweet at Expedition Live. Uh, and you can also watch archives of our live streams um, on our website, expeditionlive.org. So um, check in with us, follow us. We're tweeting about the cool stuff we're finding out here in real time. So you can keep up that way. Love it. Lindsay, thanks again. Thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you for another Dino Dig on Wednesday, August 4th at noon, right here at the Natural Sciences YouTube channel. Bye everybody. <laughs>